Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, AMD's Threadripper, 16 cores and 32 threads of amazing performance on the high-end X399 platform. I have a $3,000 system build that is tremendous performance for the money with plenty of room for future expansion. Are you looking for a computer for content creation, running multiple virtual machines, 3D animation, 4K video editing and rendering? Are you looking for a computer that can basically do everything you can throw at it, short of perhaps a high-end server array? You've come to the right place. This is an excellent value for the money for a premium experience. Linked in the video description below will be everything that I've included here. This machine's already built, and we're gonna talk about this at length, but if you just wanna see the parts that are included, links to Amazon and Newegg, those are affiliate links, they do support the channel, will be down in the description below. And if you're looking to buy any of this stuff, please consider using those when shopping, it'd be very beneficial. Now, as for the purpose of this machine, my use is gonna be for 4K video editing and rendering for my YouTube channel. It's a content creation machine, and it is superior in many respects over a consumer level machine. Now, if you just wanna play some video games and edit some Word documents and edit a couple of images, this is of course overkill. But if you're working with a lot of video content or doing a lot of 3D rendering or running multiple virtual machines, doing scientific tests or applications, then this is a huge performance jump over the consumer level machines. Ryzen 7 has eight cores, 16 threads. This has 16 cores, 32 threads. It's essentially two Ryzen 7s glued together. And actually that's effectively what it is inside. There's two separate chips connected by something called Infinity Fabric. That is a very cool name. And essentially it's a high speed link between them making it a 16 core 32 thread chip. You also get the benefit of quad channel RAM with double the transfer rate of the consumer platforms. If you work with large amounts of video files, either high bit rate or multiple video files in edit or large data sets for either VM, scientific work, three, whatever you're working with, if there's lots of data data involved, quad channel RAM makes a difference. 64 PCI Express lanes. Now for, again, one graphics card and just a game machine, not too big of a deal. And yes, you can put multiple graphics cards in here and have them run at 16X lanes, but the real beauty of this machine is being able to install a lot of other stuff. 10 gigabit or multiple 10 gigabit networking cards or hyper cards like this. This supports four NVMe M.2 drives in a single X16 card that you can drop in and you can get incredible throughput and incredible storage and data transfer rate. You can put two of these in if you want to. So there's a lot of options for expansion, uh, drives, video cards that aren't available in the consumer platforms. The best benefit, this is not that much more expensive than the consumer platforms. Right now, a Ryzen 7 2700X is about $300. This Threadripper 1950X, double the cores, double the threads, is about $550 in December of 2018 when I'm filming it. Now it's per core performance is about 10% slower than the 2700X, but multi-threaded, which is the only thing you should consider using this for, it is monstrously faster, 80% faster than a 2700X, for less than double the money. You are absolutely getting a perfect scale of price to performance in terms of multi-threaded performance because it's about 80% more expensive and it's about 80% faster. That is a heck of a deal. The only extra real cost beyond the direct performance increase for the price increase is the motherboard. The motherboards for X399 do cost just a touch more. This particular board from ASUS here, it's their mid-level board, it's about $350. Compare that to $200 for a premium X470 board for Ryzen, that's $150 more. But if you're doing this kind of work, putting in NVMe, putting in quality video and building a nice machine, $150, maybe $200 more for this much of an increase with the benefit, not just of processing power of the quad channel RAM and the PCI Express lanes, this is a deal. Do I sound excited yet? I am. As I said, this has already been built. I've already rendered videos on this. Last year's Ultimate Computer Build 2017 was the $4,000 Skylake X system, i7-7820, that machine is an eight core 16 thread computer. It's a very good machine. Per core performance is very good. It is nice, but noticeably slow and lacking in PCI Express lanes compared to this. 
and it was $1,000 more expensive. This is three grand, that was four grand. This is faster for less money, that's a deal. The 2016 Ultimate System build, for those of you who may not have been around back in 2016, was a six core 12 thread Broadwell E i7-6800K, nice machine that was also $4,000. AMD has done a wonderful job of bringing the price uh, to performance higher Basically, the price dropped, the performance went up, and it's just a deal all the way around. If you're looking for performance and you want value for the money, this is definitely where it's at. Now, some of you watching this video might say, did you just say 1950X? Aren't there second gen thread rippers out? Isn't there the 2950X? Yes, there is. And you might consider one, it just depends. The 1950X is about $250 less expensive than the 2950X for 10% performance difference. It's a third less money for only 10% less performance. From a dollar to performance point of view, the 1950X is a better deal. If you want a little bit extra performance, by all means, uh, but you're looking at spending $900 versus 550, and that's a fairly large, I said 250, that is a $350 price difference. That's a fairly large uh, price difference for a 10% performance difference which is why not only have I built this 1950X, I have another one coming soon, and I'll do a video on that as well, slightly different configuration, because we're gonna have two content creation machines for the channel. Now, having given that long speech about the CPU, some of the rest of these components might seem somewhat pedestrian by comparison. It is sort of the flagship, which is why it's right up here in front and center. The rest of the components are easy enough to configure per your needs. I don't expect, if you're looking at building a machine like this, if you wanna take a step up above the consumer machines, I don't expect you all to build this exact machine. This is a representative example of what you can build. There are pros and cons to making changes. Every change either costs money or sacrifice features. I have 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 megahertz RAM in here. I did that to hit the $3,000 price point because I think a lot of people will start at 32 gigs of RAM. I will, in all honesty, probably end up with 64 gigs of RAM in here at some point. I still have my 64 kit in the Skylake X machine. It'll get moved over to this at some point. But that's just a direct dollar expenditure. About $250 more will upgrade you from 32 to 64 gigs of RAM. Whether or not you need 64 depends upon what you're doing. If you're using the RAM, add more RAM. If you're not, don't. With eight RAM slots, it's easy enough to put in 32 and add 32 more in the future. Before we get to the storage, I think the motherboard is worth discussing. There are a variety of X399 motherboards on the market. Which one you buy is very much personal choice. Remember that with motherboards, there's really no performance difference between the boards. It really comes down to features for the money. How many M.2 slots do you want? Do you care if it has RGB? Hey, people like RGB even in a content creation machines. Uh, how many USB ports does it have? Does it come with 10 gigabit networking? Now I know some people are gonna say, what about overclocking? Great question, glad you asked. Don't. If you're buying a system like this, it is my opinion that you should run it at stock speeds. If you are making money with your computer, if the work that you're doing on your computer involves rendering content or editing or doing something where time is money, overclocking does not make sense. Yes, you can get 10, maybe 15% more performance out of the CPU by setting it to four gigahertz. This particular motherboard even has an easy four gigahertz overclock profile set right into the BIOS. You can go in there, choose four gigahertz, reboot, fairly aggressive settings, lots of voltage, it'll run warm, but it will work. However, you're looking at taking a one hour video render and making it take 54 minutes. That's really all that you're saving. You're saving six minutes an hour of render time to run much hotter with much greater power draw and with a risk of system instability. My system crashing is not worth it. I do not run my production machines overclocked. My Skylake X is not overclocked. My Broadwell E was not overclocked. My Ryzen 7 that I used prior to getting the Skylake X was not overclocked. And this is not overclocked. So if your question is, what board should I buy for overclocking? I would ask, what are you doing with your machine that 10% performance makes that big of a difference? If you really want 10% more performance, buy the 2950X and spend a little bit extra. 
But as far as motherboards go, this is a nice $350 mid-range board. It's got two M.2 slots on it, plenty of PCI Express slots for adding things like video cards and the uh, hyper card that I showed you a minute ago. There is something to consider with motherboards. Not all X399 boards support bifurcation, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, of their PCI Express slots. ASUS boards do, Gigabyte boards don't, and I don't have personal experience with the MSI or ASRock boards. I think the ASRocks do, and if I had to guess, the MSIs do, but I haven't tried it. This particular card requires that the X16 slot in the BIOS be able to be dynamically set to four X4 slots. Essentially, it's turning it into four four X slots. This card divides the X16 slot into four four X slots and gives each of the four PCI Express NVMe drives on here its own basically slot assigned to the CPU. If you install this card or one like it, there's other brands out there, ASRock makes one, etc., into a Gigabyte X399 board, it will not work. It will only show one of the four because those boards do not support bifurcation of the slot. So if that's something you're interested in, that's something to be aware of on these boards. Beyond that, mostly it's just features uh, for the money and how many extra things you want put on the board. You can spend five or $600 on an X399 board, but I think that's overkill in my opinion. 300 is probably the minimum. 400 is probably the max. When you go beyond that, you're kind of, you're buying the flagship premium boards at that point. But beyond that and the bifurcation issue, pick your favorite brand. Uh, from all the reports that I've read of the various boards, I wouldn't have any issue using Gigabyte, ASRock, MSI, or ASUS boards in my build. Moving on from the motherboard, let's talk about storage now. With a system of this caliber for professional use, there's no excuse to have anything but an NVMe boot drive. And right now, the Samsung 970 series is top of the hill. I wouldn't put anything less in such a build. I put a one terabyte 970 Evo drive in this machine. Those of you who watched last year's video would have seen that I put a 960 Pro drive in, and I gave an explanation for why I did at the time. Since using that machine for the past year, my thinking has changed a bit because I had two uh, main drives in that machine. I had a 960 Pro as the boot drive, 500, 512 gigs, and a 960 Evo 500 gig secondary drive to split the rights between them. In retrospect, if I had it to do over again, I would have just put a one terabyte drive in and been done with it. But having that many drives on that high-end platform was a little bit new and I was playing around with it at the time. So you learn. And so we've evolved our position. Here's why. The 500 gig drives have a 400 terabyte total drive write life on the pro drives. This has a 600 terabyte total drive write life it is not double because it's an Evo rather than a Pro, but it's still higher. And it's really close in price to the 512 gig 970 Pro. Now I've just throw out a whole bunch of numbers there. So let me make this really simple for you. If you're building a machine like this, make your boot drive, make your initial drive large, make it quality, you are going to end up doing a lot of writes to it. All the temp file access, the uh, voiceover work in Adobe, all the, when you render, there's a lot of temp files, but you can change those directories around to be sure. You are going to be doing a lot of writing to your boot drive. This enables me to have 50% more drive write life on my main boot drive and ensures that I don't run out of space with all those files. That's another interesting thing that I discovered with my last machine where I had a 512 gig boot drive. You'd think, well, there's no problem there. All your data is on other drives. That's true. But what I discovered is that because the voiceover audio and because the temps and a variety of other files used in Windows and all the other programs that I use on my main production machine, I often found myself with only 100 gigabytes free on that drive and performance starts to slow down, drive right amplification starts to kick up, and you really don't have a lot of free space on there. So I started having to move my older uh, audio recordings from my voiceover work and my videos to another drive. I started to having to think about it more. This drive is $230 right now and it's double the space. Now you can buy a 512 gig 970 Pro for about 180. Fine. $50 more gets you double the space and 50% more drive write life and removes the headache of 
ooh, can I put these files, my temp files, is my boot drive gonna be fine? With one terabyte, I basically don't have to care about it for a while, it's gonna last a long, long time. Performance, spectacular. So while I recommended the Pro Drive for a professional machine a year ago, I think with the current way prices are at, and it's worth noting, it would have cost you double this money back then to get a one terabyte 970, uh, 960 drive, excuse me, they're 970s now. It would have cost you like $450 back then. But now that they're 230, skip the 500s. Get yourself a one terabyte NVMe boot drive. You will appreciate it over the years that you're gonna use this machine in terms of the amount of writes you can do to it, in terms of performance, Windows builds, temp files builds. If you're doing serious content creation, I wouldn't do less than that. The rest of the storage is extremely personal. How much you need is basically up to you. Now this machine, and in the 3,000-ish dollar budget, I say ish, it's 100-ish dollars over that, but it's about 3,000 prices change every day. I have two, two terabyte SATA drives. I have a SanDisk Ultra 3D, which is the new 3D NAN version of the Ultra 2, which I've covered on my channel many times, great drive, and I have a two terabyte Crucial MX500. They're both two and a half inch drives, they're both installed on the, on the rack on the bottom there, and that provides four terabytes of storage space for raw data files, for storing output from my video renders, and just anything else that I need on my machine. Now this is not nearly enough storage for my entire channel. This is not gonna be the only machine. As I said at the beginning of the video, I'm building two Threadripper machines. I'm building this first to transition my workflow over my day-to-day -day workflow on this. And then I will take the drives that are in my Skylake X machine and move them into a Threadripper machine so I'm always making sure that I have a working computer. If you make money with your computer for a living, never take apart your production machine until you have another one up and running, which is why I'm doing it this way. I built this, Adobe's already installed on it, I've already rendered videos on it, it's very nice, I made sure it's working well so that I can start using this and then take apart my Skylake X machine. So this right here represents about $500, $550 worth of storage for four terabytes of SSD space. That's really nice. There will not be any hard drives inside here. I do use hard drives for external storage. I've got a video on my channel showing that, an external eight terabyte array with eight eight terabyte drives. I should, I should say external eight drive bay array there's 64 terabytes in that array, and that's what I use to store all of the raw footage that I've used to render videos and all the videos that I upload to YouTube and Floatplane. I'll link to that down below as well. All those videos sit on that external drive. It is more than 50% full at this point. At some point, probably in the next year or so, I'll probably have another year out of that. I will have to add some more space, but Filming video right now with my new camera at 4K, 60 frame per second, 150 megabit per second takes up a lot of space. But hopefully you guys appreciate the quality. Hopefully the quality continues to improve over time. And so all of the hard drives are external for that. All the working files I use, and frankly, if you're building a machine like this in 2018 or 2019, if you are doing this kind of work, all of your day-to-day -day working files should be on SSD. Just how much you add depends on you. I mentioned this before. I will test this out. I actually have not put this in here. It's not in the budget. I am gonna put a couple of SSDs in this and I'm gonna play around with it and do some benchmarking and testing with it. It probably will not live in this computer. It's probably gonna go into the second Threadripper when I take the NVMe drives out of my current Skylake X system, I can put them on here and thus have far more drives and that'll be sort of the main drive, uh, main system for storage. When I'm working on this computer, it'll sort of be the backup in uh, either my wife or our video editor's machine. It will access most of the raw files off the other one over the network. Probably time for 10 gigabit networking at that point, which we can do thanks to 64 uh, PCI Express lanes. Moving on to CPU coolers. CPU coolers, in my mind, on Threadripper are actually very simple and straightforward. Because I do not believe in overclocking production professional workstations, you don't need exotic, ridiculous cooling. You need good, solid cooling for stock performance. This Noctua TR4 dedicated cooler is perfect for that. It's about $80, very reasonable price for such a nice cooler at this end. It has a full die cover, full integrated heat spread cover. 
Unlike, for example, most liquid coolers that are round or adapted coolers that use brackets, the plate on this covers the entire integrated heat spreader of Threadripper, which is not square like the consumer machines and even Skylake X's. It's a rectangle. So, you want to use something designed for that. This runs cool, it runs quiet, even under full load. Now, one fan comes with this, but you can buy a second fan if you want some extra airflow. We have a very nice case here we'll talk about it in a minute. It does come with the lovely Noctua Brown fan, and some people are a fan of the Noctua Brown fans, some people aren't. Noctua does sell their high quality black fans now, and you can certainly buy one of those for about $20, $25, and either replace this or add on to it if you perhaps want a different look. It's not RGB, it's not fancy, but it is cool, and it is quiet, and it is not expensive. So if you're looking for performance for the money, that's a great option. The other thing you might consider is Cooler Master's Wraith Ripper Cooler. If you want something that perhaps is shinier and prettier than this with RGB and a nice plastic shroud and something that just screams thread ripper, it's very nice looking. I do have one. It will be on the next thread ripper build. I'm not putting it here for a variety of reasons because the other one is going to be sort of the big super ultimate build, but that will feature that cooler. It is more expensive, about 50% more expensive than this. And in terms of noise and temperatures and everything else, well, I haven't used it yet, so I don't want to comment on it too much, but I'm willing to bet that it's cool and quiet just like this is. If you want the RGB and the nicer look, buy the Wraith Ripper. If you just want performance for the money, buy the Noctua. That brings up the video card choice. Now, some of you may have been watching this entire video and you might be saying to yourself, a GeForce RTX 2080 for a video editing machine? Why? Are you planning on playing games with this computer? No, I'm not. I actually have not yet played a single game on this computer. I have benchmarked it, I've run Blender on it, uh, Adobe's installed, I have edited videos. In fact, two or three of the videos that you have already seen on this channel were actually rendered on this machine. I've tweeted some of the rendering results of this on Twitter. My link to Twitter down in the description below. If you don't currently follow me, please do so. I've not played a game on it. It's not for gaming. That's not, I mean, you can play games on it. That's not the point though. I've got gaming machines. My primary Twitch streaming machine, link to my Twitch account down in the description below as well. I have an i7-8700K machine, which is frankly a far superior gaming machine to a Threadripper and it streams games wonderfully. So I don't need to game on it. That's not what the graphics card is for. The graphics card is here for two reasons. Number one, I have it because I review graphics cards for a living that probably doesn't apply to you, but that's honestly one of the reasons why it's in here is I have it from my graphics card reviews. The other reason it's in here is not everybody does CPU only work at this level. Some animation work, some video encoding work, especially Adobe After Effects. Many of those are GPU accelerated. A faster graphics card can help with some of those, not all. And most of the straight rendering is done on the CPU in Adobe, although that's starting to change. There are other programs, DaVinci Re Resolve, etc., that will use the GPU more in video encoding than Adobe does. Come on, Adobe, get with it. It's 2018 already. Use the GPU more. So as more stuff uses the GPU, that's going to come in handy. How much graphics card you put in depends entirely upon what you're doing. If you anticipate doing things that you will use GPU for acceleration that actually uh, make use of that power. By all means, buy yourself an $800 graphics card and get epic, awesome performance. On the flip side, if you use Adobe and you don't run tons of After Effects, if you just do straight encoding, if the type of workloads you do are primarily CPU bound, fair enough, you don't need this. A GTX 1050 will run three 4K monitors for content creation without any issue whatsoever. Just pick a model that has three display ports on the back. You don't need lots of graphics card for this. You could knock $700 off the price of this machine or put that $700 in RAM and SSDs and whatever else you want to put in your system if you don't need a fancy graphics card. That's why it's here, but that's a very, very personal decision based upon what you're doing with the computer. Now, I said a minute ago, this isn't meant for gaming. I've got an i7-8700K for gaming. I, I don't need to game on this. Your situation may be different. You may be watching this video saying, but wait a minute. What if I only want to build one computer? 
Maybe I uh, work out of my house. Maybe I do both content creation and play games. I don't want to buy two different computers. I don't have space for two different computers. I don't want to mess around with two different computers. Can't I use this for gaming? Yes, you can. Absolutely. It's roughly the performance of a Ryzen 7 1700X or 1800X out of the box in gaming. You can play games at up to 100 frames per second at any resolution so long as your graphics card is strong enough on the CPU. Shadow of the Tomb Raider will absolutely run over 100 frames per second on this graphics card at any resolution so long as your detail settings aren't set. To. 4K Ultra is not going to run over 100, but that's the fault of the graphics card, not the fault of the CPU. So long as you're within reasonable limits on your graphics card, then this CPU will play games at 100 maybe 120 frames per second without any issue. An i7-8700K would cost less and run them faster. But if you only want one computer, yeah, absolutely. You can certainly do that and it will play games just fine. It's just not my use case. But again, I review graphics cards for a living, so that's why that's going in there. Power supply. A high-end CPU, a high-end motherboard, and a large $3,000 build deserves nothing less than a quality power supply. The G3 series from EVGA is one of the best power supplies on the market. Johnny Guru, who is frankly more of an expert in power supplies than I am, he's one of those guys with thousands of dollars in test equipment. He takes apart power supplies, he analyzes them, he has voltage ripple detectors and a lot of other stuff that probably I don't understand as well as he does. He tests a lot of different power supplies and he states, and I think he's got like a 12 or 13 page review of this thing, that it's one of the finest power supplies that he's ever tested easily a nine and a half out of 10, great for high-end machines. That's good enough for me. This is also a very reasonable deal. Right now when I'm filming this video, this 850 watt, 80 plus gold, fully modular power supply, 10 plus year warranty is $100. $100 for a power supply for a $3,000 system, that is easy. Don't cheap out on your power supply. I've advocated for less expensive power supplies in previous videos. I've done builds with 450 watt and 500 watt, 80 plus bronze and even 80 plus white power supplies. Not on a build like this. On a build like this, not only do you want to use a quality 80 plus gold, you also want to use a good one. Not all of them are created equal. Some of the Seasonic units are really nice. EVGA is nice. A Corsair RMX, uh, the fully modular RMX line would also be really nice or their HXI, for example, would be really nice. Don't get a cheap power supply. Get something nice. And at $100 for an 850 watt, I think that's a good deal. You don't actually need 850 watts for this build as presented here. This CPU stock is gonna use 180, maybe 200 watts at the most, even if you put a mild over, well, if you put a decent overclock on, it'll be in the mid 200s, but it's not gonna exceed 200 watts out of the box under any circumstances. This graphics card, worst case scenario, might pull 250 watts, closer to 200. Let's say with the motherboard and the graphics card and the CPU and the RAM, maybe worst case scenario, you're looking at 500 watts with a full load on both the CPU and the graphics card, and that's not likely to happen. Please make note of this point. If you are video rendering or doing 3D animation that is CPU bound, your graphics card is not being used. If you are doing GPU accelerated effects or something that's driving the graphics card hard, you aren't pushing this. The CPU does not pull 180 watts when you're using eight cores and you're running your graphics card hard. It only pulls 180 watts when you're using all 16. So odds are you're only using one of these max at any one point in time. But let's say you are using the max, fine, 500 watts. The SSDs pull like two to five watts a piece. They're trivial. And unless you're going with a second graphics card, a 650 watt power supply would be enough. I would not do that. 850 watts is the lowest I'd put in here. 750 would be okay. Here's why. The fan turns once the load passes about 40% on most of these power supplies. So you're going to have a silent system unless you're actually actively encoding. So you're going to have a very, very quiet computer. Furthermore, the 80 plus gold power efficiency 
only really applies to the middle band of consumption. If you're pulling 80% of the power supply's uh, total rating, you don't get as efficient of a unit as you do at 50% usage. So having an overrated power supply, which I don't normally recommend in budget builds, but this is not a budget build, makes sense both for noise, for longevity, and for power efficiency. You use less electricity by buying a slightly larger power supply. And to be blunt, there's like a $15 difference between the 650 and the 850, so get yourself an 850. The 1000 isn't even that much more than this. So if you're thinking of adding a second graphics card or 10 hard drives or a really exotic build, maybe the 1000 makes sense. That brings us to our case choice. Cases are extremely personal. I have built several machines in very nice large full tower cases. This is a mid-sized tower case, which is a, a bit of a deviation off of what I did last year. Both my 2016 Ultimate build and my 2017 build were in Corsair Obsidian 750B cases. They still are, I love those cases. But they're not shiny, they're not flashy, they have no glass on them, and they're not RGB. And so for 2018, we went with a shiny glass RGB case. Pretty reasonable price, however, $150. There is mesh on the front. This is a Cooler Master H500P mesh in gunmetal. You can also get it in white. It's got glass on that side. It's got metal on this side, so it hides your nasty cable management. I did do some cable management work here, but there's a lot of cables on the back. It does have acrylic on the top, but it does have decent sized vents that are larger than the width of my thumb here on both sides. And as I said before, airflow is not a problem in this case. With the mesh in the front and the two large 200 millimeter fans, the exhaust fan out the back, and the wonderful knock to a cooler, I've already encoded videos on this. There is no heat and no noise issues in this case. So if you're looking at this going, can I buy something like this, one of the H500 series, so long as it has mesh on the front, I don't like the ones with acrylic, but so long as it has the mesh grill on the front, you can get this now in the H500. H500P and H500M models, they all do very, very well with a build like this. Although having said that, don't build this in the H500 straight case with no M or P. Get the M or the P. It's worth noting that these are E-ATX boards. They're wider than standard ATX boards. The H500P and the H500M are rated to take E-ATX, extended ATX boards. This straight H500 is not which is fine, $150 case for a $3,000 build is completely reasonable. If you want more shiny, you could get an H500M. You could also get a Corsair Obsidian 500D or 750D or, well, frankly, any of 50 different large cases on the market. What I wouldn't try to do and don't recommend doing is trying to get a micro ATX case with a micro ATX board and trying to build some super compact machine. You're building a 16 core 32 Threadripper beast Give it some airflow, it'll run cool and quiet and give you great performance. Thus concludes the parts overview of the 1950X Threadripper build, $3,000 December 2018 Ultimate System build. It is a very, very nice machine. This is longer than your average YouTube video and quite long even by my standards these days, but I hope it is useful and informative to you. If you are genuinely in the market to build one of these machines, if you're trying to find out what RAM, what cooler, what case, what power supply to use, then this long form video hopefully is useful to your decision making process. As I said at the beginning of this video, links to all of this and some alternatives that I mentioned during this video will be linked down in the description below. Those are affiliate links to Amazon and Newegg. They do support the channel at no extra cost to you while you're using them. I would certainly appreciate the support if you are in the market for something like this. If you're in the market for something, uh, I don't wanna say simpler, but perhaps more consumer oriented, I've definitely done those videos on my channel, Ryzen 7s, i7s, etc. This is sort of a build of a different sort. One final point before we go. Some of you may be asking, where are the benchmarks? This CPU is 18 months old. I don't think at this point you really need me for benchmarks. All the benchmarks you can find all over the place are fine. It hasn't changed in performance since it launched, and it's certainly been covered in that regard. That's not the point of this video, which is why I'm not going to even bother showing you the benchmarks. I played around with it, I tested it for my own purposes. I wanted to make sure it genuinely was faster than the Skylake X and the Ryzen 7s, it really is, and at current prices, it's the easy decision in terms of price to performance. But as far as its own performance and its own right, 
everything you're finding on YouTube is more or less accurate. So we're gonna skip the time it takes to do that and build something new and get that done. So I'm not going to provide you with any benchmarks on this. Instead, I'm discussing the thought process and decision making behind all of these parts, why they're here to help you make a more informed purchase. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below. Hit the bell notification icon next to the subscribe button if you'd like to actually know when new videos come out. Hit the join button next to the subscribe button if you'd like to become a member of the Tech Deal Nation and support this channel. Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions down in the comment section below. I don't respond to everybody, but I do read every comment left beneath my videos and I do appreciate the time you take in leaving them. Links in the description below, as I mentioned, one final point of clarity. This cooler was provided by Noctua. This case was provided by Cooler Master. This RAM was provided by Adata. Nothing else on this table was provided by any of these companies. I bought the CPU, the motherboard, the video card, the power supply, this adapter, and the SSDs all myself. So this is definitely not a sponsored build in any way, shape, or form. Okay, there's three parts that were provided by companies, but that's a minor part of it overall. So when I ask you to support by clicking on those links in the description below, it's because, well, frankly, I could use your support. I would prefer to do videos where I put them together the way I think they should be built, as opposed to the way sponsors would. So your support is definitely appreciated. Thanks so much for watching this video. I will see you next time.